Greetings, dear siblings in Christ. I'm Pastor Heather Apel, Assistant to the Bishop for Leadership in the Indiana, Kentucky of the ELCA. As we hear an extravagant story of love and grace on this fifth Sunday of Lent, it's a way that we continue on in this season journeying with Jesus as he makes his way to the cross and empty tomb. Hear now a reading from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have a friend of mine that has been sending our family Christmas and Easter cards for somewhere near the last 15 years or so. And I know on the surface that may not seem that unusual. After all, both my husband and I are pastors, and so this holiday is kind of a big deal for us. But the unusual part of this story is that these are not your typical heartwarming cards filled with pictures of peaceful nativity scenes or crosses adorned with lilies. No, these are the kind of what you would call politically incorrect cards filled with humor and jokes that maybe are just a little off key. I'll never forget the card that she sent us a few years ago that connects perfectly with our gospel lesson for today. The front of the card had only four words. Judas, worst friend ever. And then inside the card, it simply said, Happy Easter, and was signed by the couple. I'm thankful for these friends that understand the stress and extra demands that the Christmas and Lent and Easter season bring into our family's life and send us these humorous cards to encourage us with a sign of love and support and maybe a little laughter too. But the reason this card came to mind as I was spending time studying this week's gospel lesson is that I felt like this humorous greeting card actually got it right. Judas pretty much was the worst friend ever to Jesus. For in today's text, we see two very different examples of discipleship portrayed in the characters of the story. On the one hand, we have Mary and Martha, two women who demonstrate the ultimate model of what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus, taking on the role of a servant leader as they put themselves last and the needs of others, and especially Jesus in this case, first. Contrasting them is Judas, a man who tries to portray himself as one who cares for the poor and the needs of others, However, the author of the gospel makes it clear to the reader the true motivations behind Judas's words about selling the perfume for money. And so when I read texts like this, it sometimes baffles me 
to know that Judas was part of Jesus' inner circle during his ministry. The one who would betray Jesus and hand him over to the authorities to be killed was one of his close associates and confidants. How could God have let it happen this way? Wouldn't it have been easier, maybe not sting as much, if the betrayer had been a stranger or a casual bystander rather than one of the twelve? As much as this betrayal by a friend aspect of the salvation gets me sometimes a little mad or even confused with the way that the event transpired, it also gives me hope. Hope because I know that there have been plenty of times that I too have betrayed Jesus by my words or actions, or sometimes lack of action. I know that while I strive to be a faithful follower and servant of God, like Mary and Martha are portrayed, my first instinct is often a selfish desire to look out for my own needs. And so perhaps that part of the story resonates with you too. Maybe you've had moments in your life when you feel more like a Judas and less like a Mary or Martha type. Martin Luther was known for saying that we are simul justus et peccator, which means that we are simultaneously saint and sinner. We have been made righteous by the salvation of Jesus, but we are still sinful in our broken human lives here and now. And so in that sense, we are both Judas and Mary all rolled into one. And therein lies the beauty of God's grace. Both the sisters and Judas were loved by Jesus. Judas was allowed to keep hanging out with the disciples, even though Jesus knew what was going to happen. Several chapters earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus refers to one of the twelve as a devil, indicating that he knew that one of them would betray him, even then. And yet, he lets Judas stay. Quite frankly, there's a lot of Jesus' ministry that contradicts what I think would have been the natural course for God to take, which is exactly why God is God and I am not. For Isaiah 55 verse 8 puts it well, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. The reminder that God's plans are not the same as ours can be very useful when we hear a story like this. Because maybe there's a part of us that actually would agree with Jesus. Wouldn't it have served better to sell that costly perfume, which was the equivalent to about a year's worth of wages, and then use that money for the poor? Isn't that what Jesus was all about? If this were the only text that a person heard regarding Jesus, it could portray him as unsympathetic or heartless since it appears that Jesus is more concerned with his own desires rather than the needs of the poor. Well, fortunately for us, we know the rest of the story and can understand how this extravagant act of Mary was being used by Jesus as a sign that his time was at hand, not as a selfish act. To better understand the story, we have to recognize that there are many levels to Mary's actions starting with a simple devotion and love for Jesus, going deeper then to thankfulness for having raised her brother Lazarus from the dead, and then concluding with a prophetic action which announces that Jesus' death has now begun. For it was customary at that time to use spices and precious ointments to prepare a body for burial which Jesus then alludes to in his comments about Mary's actions. And so we might also think about and understand her action to
to serve as a foreshadowing of what was to come. For we know in biblical tradition, there are many stories where kings' heads are anointed with oil as a sign of their role. And so in this story, it's Jesus' feet, not his head, which is anointed, pointing to the fact that he would be a very different kind of king, the kind of servant king who would willingly die in order to save God's people from their sins. This anointing of Jesus by Mary marks the beginning of his death march to the cross, as the very next story in John's Gospel depicts Jesus entering Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna and palm branches, which we know will soon turn to shouts of crucify him. And sometimes it might be easy for us to read this account of Jesus' passion and miss some of the connections to the Old Testament, since it's easy for us to just focus on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then move forward in the scriptures. Rather, it's important for us, though, to know how Jesus' sacrificial death was the pinnacle of God's salvation story, which really begins all the way back in Genesis. For in Jesus, God was doing a new thing, similar to the new thing that was occurring at the time of the people in the Old Testament reading today from Isaiah 43. God knew it was important for the people to be aware of the past, the way that God had acted in their lives, saving them from the hand of their enemies and rescuing them from slavery. But they couldn't remain stuck in the past. They had to pay attention to what God was doing right then, around them, right under their noses, as God was once again about to bring them out of oppression and restore their broken relationships. This new thing that took place in Isaiah's time and also took place in Mary and Martha and Judas's time is still happening here and now in this time. It is the new thing that God does in each and every one of us every day as we live our lives as God's disciples in the world. It's a chance to wake up every morning filled and facing with uncertain days, with events and temptations, successes and failures, knowing that we face the day as loved, forgiven children of God. We all have faced challenges in the last few years, some different than others, but no one has been unaffected by the ways that the pandemic has changed our workplaces and schools, our churches and communities, our homes and our everyday life. And so as we continue to make our way through this wilderness desert, I want to once again lift up the example of Mary in this story as a model of how God is calling us to act. For we sometimes think that we have to wait to use our gifts for how that God has given us, as if it needs to be the perfect time before we can do what we believe God is calling us to do. And Mary didn't think that way. She could have saved that perfume for her family's own financial stability, or maybe just used little bits of it over time. However, instead of being cautious with the extravagant gift that she had, she chose to go all in and follow in the example of Jesus. She took all that she had and used it for where she felt God calling her anointing Jesus for what he was being called to do as he prepared to go all in and begin his journey toward the cross. Whether we find ourselves today feeling more like Judas than a Mary, we can trust and hope in the good news that God does not change. 
We see the evidence of that from the past accounts of how God's lavish grace has been poured out, both in the stories of scriptures, but in our own lives, too. And knowing the story of God's love, faithfulness, and salvation, in spite of our own failings and Judas moments, gives us the ability to face both the present and the future, not with fear, but with expectation and eagerness for the new thing that God will be doing next. Thanks be to God for this promise in our lives. Amen. As we now join in a time of prayer, each petition will conclude with the words, Merciful God, and you're invited to respond, receive our prayer. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Do a new thing in the church. Free us from the paradigms that no longer serve the gospel and bring forward leaders who can imagine fresh ways of doing ministry. Give us courage in the face of challenge. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing for creation. Reverse the trajectory of climate change and environmental catastrophe. Revive habitats already impaired by human disregard. Amplify the voices of climate scientists and researchers working to chart a new course. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing in our world. Break barriers that prevent political enemies from working together for the well-being of all. Make a way for peace and collaboration among the nations. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing for those who suffer. Reveal a path for any who are unemployed or underemployed, for those experiencing homelessness, and for all who struggle with money. Comfort those who grieve and restore those who are sick. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing within us. Direct us to encounters that broaden our understanding of the human experience. Amplify voices that are ignored or devalued. Deliver us especially from the scourge of racism. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Do a new thing in our death. Fill us with the knowledge of Christ and the power of his resurrection as we give thanks for all the saints who have attained the prize of their heavenly call. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. You are the children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you now and always. Amen. <laughs>